economy in the means of production, first systematically carried out in the factory system and there from the very beginning, coincident with the most reckless squandering of labour power and robbery of the conditions normally requisite for labour. This economy now shows its antagonistic and murderous side more and more in a given branch of industry. In this section, Marx examines the effects that machinery and modern industry had on previous other industries. He notes that as small-scale industries struggle to compete against the larger-scale industries and their machinery basis, they tend to employ the cheapest unskilled labour possible, which at the time were women and children, often in terrible working conditions, and to extend the length of the working day for as long as possible, while enforcing more intense labour from the workers. It's only when these methods reach their maximum limit that the smaller scale industries change to incorporate some of the technologies and machinery used in larger scale production. However, when labor becomes cheaper, these methods are often used again in these small scale industries. It's interesting to note that Marx highlights that these practices were very common in the clothing industries of his time. And we still see the exact same methods being used today all around the world in what we now call sweatshops. The great production of surplus value in these branches of labour and the progressive cheapening of their articles were and are chiefly due to the minimum wages paid, which has just sufficed for a miserable vegetable existence and to the extension of the hours of labour to the maximum endurable by the human organism. It was in fact the cheapness of the human sweat and the human blood which were converted into commodities, which permitted the expansion of the market. This was especially true of England's colonial market, where, besides, English states and habits prevail. At last, the critical point was reached. The basis of the old method, sheer brutality in the exploitation of the workers, accompanied by a more or less systematic division of labour, no longer sufficed for the extending markets and for the still more rapidly extending competition of the capitalists. The hour of the machine had struck. An interesting observation can be made here in regards to production and the market, or supply and demand. Typically, what we see in bourgeois economics, even to this day, is that demand dictates the supply. However, what we see here is the opposite. The demand is being created by the supply. Capitalism's motive for production is creating more and more surplus value, which by cheapening the commodity leads to a growth in the market. When the market can no longer be filled by traditional production methods and it reaches its limits, machinery, however, breaks through these barriers by cheapening the products further and expanding the market again. However, this is a topic left for volume three of Capital. The main points in this section are largely things that have previously been discussed. Working conditions were extremely poor, causing sickness and ill health in the workers. Marx details many examples, but the fact that sanitary regulations had to actually be imposed says quite a lot about the system itself. Another point that Marx has discussed before is that as the division of labour and machinery under capitalism reduces workers of all sexes and ages, to a single cog in the machine, they lose previous skills and knowledge over the labour process and the ability to pass on this knowledge to future generations. However, this leads Marx to an interesting but brief point, though one that unfortunately isn't really expanded on in capital. Modern industry never looks upon and treats the existing form of a process as final. The technical basis of that industry is therefore revolutionary, while all earlier modes of production were essentially conservative. The force of facts, however, compelled it at last to acknowledge that modern industry, in overturning the economic foundation on which was based the traditional family and the family labour corresponding to it, had also unloosened all traditional family ties. However terrible and disgusting the disillusion under the capitalist system of the old family ties may appear, nevertheless modern industry by assigning as it does an important part in the process of production outside the domestic sphere to women, to young persons and to children of both sexes creates a new economic foundation for a higher form of the family 
and of the relation between the sexes. It is, of course, just as absurd to hold the Teutonic Christian form of the family to be absolute and final as it would be to apply that character to the ancient Roman, the ancient Greek, or the Eastern forms which, moreover, taken together, form a series in historical development. Moreover, it is obvious that the fact of the collective working group being composed of individuals of both sexes and all ages must necessarily, under suitable conditions, become a source of humane development, although in its spontaneously developed, brutal capitalistic form where the labour exists for the process of production and not the process of production for the labourer, that fact is a pestiferous source of corruption and slavery. Capitalism is revolutionary. In its continual breaking down and pushing past previous methods of production, and its thirst for an ever-increasing supply of workers, incorporating women and children into the labour force, it forces equality, but an equality of exploitation. By bringing all people under its domination and into the workforce, it breaks through and revolutionises traditional societal structures and concepts of the family. This isn't to say that capitalism is liberating, quite the opposite, but we can see how throughout history, and even just our more recent history for an example, from the constantly changing dynamics of women and children being employed then removed from wage work in the early 20th century, to the emergence of the nuclear family in the 50s, the reintegration of women in the workforce in the later half of the 20th century, and today with single parents and LGBTQ plus families, how the idea of the family itself is a social construct structured in its relationship towards production. Capitalist production, therefore, develops technology and the combining together of various processes into a social whole only by sapping the original sources of all wealth, the soil and the labourer. In this final short section, Marx discusses modern industry's effect on agriculture. He argues that machinery has its greatest effect in this industry, as it completely revolutionised the previous modes of production annihilating the old feudal ties as the peasant instead became a wage labourer. This again plays into a subject discussed earlier in the chapter on how capitalist production has a twofold effect. It concentrates populations into the factories and industries in urban towns and cities, increasing the city's social importance, which then concentrates the historical motive force of society. While at the same time, it disturbs the metabolic interaction of man and the earth, or the country, preventing humans from their return to the soil, our own means for our own food and clothing. By this action, it both destroys the physical health of the urban worker and the intellectual life of the rural worker. But while it upsets these naturally grown conditions for human survival, capital, at the same time, calls for the restoration of it, only now, under command of its own capitalist production. In the very first chapter of Capital, Marx introduced us to the concept of abstract labour, humans' ability to perform labour or work, the common substance that relates commodities to each other and socially in its amount of time is the creation of value. While it's not something that is directly touched upon by Marx here, but throughout both this and the previous chapter, we can almost actually see this abstract idea. Through cooperation and division of labour, we saw how capitalism continually fragments the labour process into ever more specialised and simplified jobs or tasks that are performable by anyone. This unskilled labour, or the ability to simply switch from job to job and be moulded from task to task, highlights the concept of abstract labour, or that the physical activity or process of labour becomes almost secondary to people's willingness or their ability to labour. <laughs>